you and I met and connected and bonded deeply in a very geeky way <laughs> <laughs> over the music of 100 years ago. That's right. The music of the 1920s, but also over what led to that moment, that kind of like awkward growth spurt moment of the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. And I feel like history is repeating itself in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's so many incredible parallels between yep. what we're living now and what happened to lead to that age of Renaissance. Yeah, it was a fascinating time. And it's easy to lose sight of it because what was considered hot and sexy in music and other ways back then now looks so tame. But there was ragtime, which was invented by black people, took the country by storm. That kind of rhythm was something that no white person had had any reason to experience until then. You read in the reviews about how the music is so wonderful that it makes it so that you can barely keep your toes from tapping. And you're thinking, well, what music doesn't? But the thing is, they didn't know that kind of music. And so ragtime happens. That's the big craze in the aughts and into the teens. And then there's this thing called jazz that comes out of it. So it was a very black era in <laughs> popular music entertainment early in the 20th century. And it wasn't just jazz. There were a few decades of it. And yeah. now here we are again. And, and I mean, for me, you know, my, my lens into this is also the place where that hot, sexy thing translates into other genres. And there's this moment of Renaissance and classical music and, mm -hmm. you know, the high arts. But I mean, maybe what you just said is enough of an explanation to start with. It was something new. It was the first time you could feel a groove mm -hmm. and a beat. So that's, I mean, that's significant. Mm -hmm. But if you listen to Langston Hughes, he says that the Harlem Renaissance started exactly in 1921 mm -hmm. when Shuffle Along opened on Broadway. Mm -hmm. It was the first all black musical that was a mainstream success. Mm -hmm. It launched the careers of Josephine Baker. Ubi Blake was the creative composer. The composer. Mm -hmm. the, it was an all black creative team. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone went. You had to see the show. It had an extended run and then it toured all over the country. It was... A great score, peppy songs, dance numbers that were absolutely thrilling. Nobody white on Broadway danced the way these people danced at the time. And it was a great, it was a great piece of, of music theater in 1921. Also, my favorite Shuffle Along reference, not to be geeky or anything, <laughs> um, it really, but it has to do with the way that things were cross-pollinating and that people were mingling during that that time of renaissance mm -hmm. so william grant still mm -hmm. is playing oboe in the pit oh, for that. shuffle along right and then finally the run ends because that's been his life and then the depression hits and he's got nothing to do so what does he do he writes his first symphony <laughs> i didn't know that order wow that's yeah. interesting he literally rented an apartment and you know there were no gigs so he had time and to write a symphony. and so he wrote a symphony <laughs> yeah. and it was good it was really good <laughs> There are so many artists, black artists of the early part of the 20th century whose work has been totally forgotten and who had impact in their day, but still within sort of a you know confined circle. And then there are the people like William Grant Still, who was a great American artist, who was recognized as a great American artist, who broke every possible color barrier as a composer, as a conductor, who was a very, very public figure. And then his work was forgotten for decades. A friend of mine who works in radio was telling me a story about being on the air in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, probably in the 80s, I think, and getting a phone call from William Grant Still's daughter, who was just cold calling radio stations to see if they had the recordings of her father's work and would they please play them on air because she was so concerned that his legacy was going to be totally forgotten. And I, how does something like that happen so quickly? Still falls through the cracks, I think, partly because his music can be too easy to enjoy. And what I mean by that is that when he was writing, there was an orthodoxy that said that classical music was supposed to go in a certain direction that challenges the ordinary ear and that I think even a lot of people who know their music well learn to like, like you learn to like wine that's kind of bitter and you say that it tastes better with food because it doesn't taste good. <laughs> and so I think that um, William Grant Still's music is really enjoyable. He wrote from the heart. It was complex, but he wasn't writing in order to show how abstruse and unlistenable he could be. And in his time, that meant, I think, that he wasn't taken as seriously as composers who more fit into that vein. So I'm not saying that Bruckner is unpleasant to listen to, but you wouldn't hum it usually. It's challenging. The pieces are very long. You wouldn't take it to the beach. Whereas with Still's music, 
often you would, and I think that was part of the problem. Then, of course, there wasn't an industry behind him because of the color of his skin mm -hmm. as well. But yeah, it's good that he is getting a new hearing because he was the goods on so many levels. I mean, it's just interesting for me as a performing artist to be bringing back music from 100 years ago that, again, had its own life then. Mm -hmm. At the same time that there's a new generation of composers and artists making new music now, and audiences are discovering these things at the same time. Yeah. Actually, I want to ask you, Laura, how do audiences seem to be feeling about the things that you're presenting to them? Oh, there's joy. Good. There's intense joy in the, um, you know, the recovery of this music. And I think that this is a place where music, you know, does its magic because it doesn't come with a burden of guilt and shame. Mm -hmm. It comes as a gift that we're all receiving together. Exactly. Um, so that's, I, I feel incredibly privileged to be part of that. It just, I think there's also kind of this sadness. There's always this expression of how did we not know this? It would have been different to have lived in this world <laughs> with this music. Yeah, Fireside. it's, um, it's funny, you end up indicting the musical culture of the 20th century in some ways, but it's a deserved indictment. There was a very limited palette of you know what a Van Cliburn played, what was on those wonderful LPs that were produced by Columbia. A lot of wonderful music, but Eugene Ormandy was limited in a way in terms of the amount of music that he could be interested in that would be considered sellable. And I think we're getting closer to a truly vivid classical music tradition here, which would be something quite different from Bruckner and Tchaikovsky and, and the like. Yeah, that's actually what I find so exciting. I think we're just reclaiming a moment that went too soon. You know, when, when you read about the music that was being programmed by great American orchestras in the 1930s. In the 30s, right. William Dawson, mm -hmm. the Philadelphia Orchestra playing Dawson's Negro Folk Symphony at Carnegie Hall with an ovation that started after the first movement. Mm -hmm. These were not isolated incidents. There was a real hunger for American music and a real embrace of music by black composers. And okay, you know, maybe it disappeared for way too long, but I, we're not, this isn't something new. We're, we're remembering something better that we used to do. Something happens to American pop culture in the 1940s, and a lot of it had to do with World War II and a certain white bread masculinity that the culture becomes full of at that time. You can see it immediately in the movies. The 30s is the Depression. The 30s is a racial melting pot. The 30s movie had a certain interest within the obvious confines of the time in black issues and black actors. Get into the 40s, and it's Betty Grable and military music, and maybe Joe Lewis walks on and says a couple of things. And the culture never gets over that. Once World War II is over, you have television coming in, the suburbanification of America, and that America is not interested in difference. And that is a problem that you have for the rest of the 20th century, ultimately. Mm -hmm. But that dividing line, it really happens in about 1939. There's no more room for William Levi Dawson after about 1939. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen less. It's when the American broadcaster accent becomes that kind of bland <laughs> Disney announcer. Everything in that decade, everything goes to hell. <laughs> and that's part of what happened to classical music as well. Um, when I think back, this is going back to Shuffle Along and you know that, that burst of energy. I try to imagine what the white audiences of the time were experiencing mm -hmm. when they were buying their tickets for Shuffle Along. And even more, like that I kind of get. It was novel for sure. But also the huge audiences for artists like Paul Robeson and Roland Hayes, black artists who were performing in you know a, a, a serious vein mm -hmm. and kind of sharing the most serious parts of their history and their tradition. Mm -hmm. I wonder about the combination of factors. Yes, it's something new. Yes, it's the Vogue. But were those people also showing their goodness and their liberal leanings by following that trend, do you think? You know, Laura, my sense is that the typical white audience member then did not see themselves as doing anybody any favors. They were there to be delighted 
And if they weren't, they would have walked out, but they were delighted because there was something very special going on. Not only was there this black show uptown, but it changed the way the downtown shows sounded, which shows how much white people genuinely liked this kind of music. And I think that extended to listening to Paul Robeson sing, and that extended to hearing something like um, William Dawson's Negro mm -hmm. Symphony. They, they, they felt it. In other words, it was, it was American despite the flaws of mm -hmm. those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also, I mean, it was coming out of a very hopeful, progressive time. I mean, mm -hmm. We've talked about this. The, those first two decades of the 20th century, everything was changing. Everyone was moving, and people were experiencing things and people they'd never encountered before. So there was exactly. an openness, I guess. Yes. Yeah. If you are somebody living in those first three decades, you were feeling the earth shifting beneath your feet to a degree that was unprecedented until this century. I mean, if you think about just the technological shifts that we've experienced since about the year 2000, I'm still disoriented at all the new things that I still can't operate. And then changes in the culture in terms of its browning. There's been a browning of American culture since the mid 90s in terms of what's now a norm, in terms of who gets cast in things, who gets elected president, what mainstream music is like, what people dance to at a wedding, whatever color they are, all of that has happened. Basically since the fall of 2020 in the performing arts in America, there was this really fast scurrying action to shift the narrative and you know join the conversation and use the hashtags and make sure that the people of color were on the front cover of your brochure. But I do think that that was just a moment in time and really a marketing question more than anything else. I think that there's a big space between what happened on that side of the equation and the response and welcome of audiences to new artists and new audiences. And I guess I wonder too a little bit about the marketing of the Harlem Renaissance, you know, and, and how that happened. You know, I think that what we've been seeing since 2020 in this realm it's one of those things where even if there was a certain <laughs> cynicism in the marketing, I think, and this gets me in trouble in some circles to say this, but I think that mainstream America was genuinely ready for and open to an infusion, for mm -hmm. example, of blackness. I think that that much progress had been made. That would not have been the case in 1970, but it cert I don't think it would have been the case in 1990, but it certainly was the case by 2020. So I think that we can count on there just being a certain natural momentum. There was greater, if not maximal, openness to blackness, and also, I think, a tacit desire for there to be a genuine and exciting and relatable American classical music experience. And so I think the time was right. History mm -hmm. is partly about chances. Now, with the Harlem Renaissance, my sense is that the typical white person who was reading their Sinclair Lewis, et cetera, only had limited interest in this thing that we call the Harlem Renaissance. And so Zora Neale Hurston could not make a living writing her books. Langston Hughes lived in what most of us would consider genteel poverty. They were dependent on benefactors who often did not think of them as whole people, et cetera. So I think of the Harlem Renaissance as something we look back on as a wonderful thing. But I think that what we're seeing now is genuinely a national phenomenon. So I, I'd rather be now. I, I, yeah. I like this better. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. And the one thing that I feel, or the, the things that I feel, um, are a sense of community, a sense of collaboration among the black artists who are, who have been, I think, in many ways working in isolation mm -hmm. and who are now coming together with a feeling of support and recognition. And that's a beautiful thing. And also, of course, you know, the next generation that's right there and about to step into a culture that's going to be so welcoming. And a culture that's going to present delicious challenges because you have to have the chops from the past as well as mm -hmm. these new chops for the present. Yeah, it's a, it's a great thing to see. Something is happening that should have happened a long time ago. I remember talking to the late, great Michael Morgan about mm -hmm. um, classical music and audiences and bringing in a black audience. And I asked him, do you, yeah, he, I, I lived in Berkeley at the time and we were talking about his Oakland stint. And I said, do you, um, do you see black people in your audiences? Are more people coming? And he said, yes, this was around the year 2000. But he said, you have to extend your sense of what classical music is. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I must admit, I was thinking, well, good luck with that. 
Well, now that would just be a very ordinary statement. That's exactly what seems to be happening around the country, whereas he at the time was telling me something that I hadn't heard and he was working relatively alone. Oh, you know, I love that you shared that story. And that's, I mean, I hadn't quite pinpointed that maybe, but yeah, I mean, Michael Morgan worked for decades in Oakland, which is a very diverse community, Mm -hmm. but he was out there in that community. He was out there grabbing those young people and bringing them into the hall and doing everything he could to communicate about the fact that classical music is many things. And I think also programming music that no one was playing at the time. Exactly. And you're so right that just by virtue of being there, of that music being there, um, that is a much more natural mm-hmm. probability. Yeah, it's it's actually, it, it's different now. I wish that he could have lived to see this, this moment. He would have enjoyed so it and he would have contributed. Well, it does feel like the beginning of many things. I'm so grateful to be part of this time. I really am. I mean, I think about that all the time. What if I were doing what I do 30 years ago? No. What if, yeah. You would be you'd be all alone. <laughs> <laughs> you'd be putting out LPs. No, it would be completely different. Yeah. It, you wouldn't be part of a moment. And I do think this is going to last. This is not just um, fashionable wokeness. People like these things, and I think partly it's because these are things that come from what America actually is. We are a melting pot, and it should be reflected in a melting kind of classical music. And that doesn't mean that it has to be easier. That doesn't mean that somebody has to get up there and you know do some licks on a clarinet. But it has to be different. It has to be something other than Sibelius. <laughs> Even <Hopefully>. Sibelius. <laughs> what did he ever do to you? <laughs> I like using it. <laughs> Um, there is this poem by Rita Dove that has been with me for a long time, and it's inspired everything from concert pieces to work that I do with young people around Everybody the country. Everybody reads her, but me, I, I'm so uncool. Tell me what the, <laughs> the poem is. Rita Dove is the coolest, yeah. number one. The poem is called Testimonial, and it's from the perspective of a child. And it's just, you know, this child who is who for whom the world is so big and vast and possible. And there's this quote that, uh, well, it goes like this. Back when everything was still to come, luck leaked out everywhere. I gave my promise to the world, and the world followed me here. And I try to connect with that poem every day and just think about what is my promise here on this earth today, Mm. because Mm. it might be different than yesterday or tomorrow. Hmm. The part of that poem that throws me a little, well, it's not in the poem, it's what you said, that your promise might change. I'm too boring and steady for that. I, I, don't, I don't think of it as changing much. I think of my promise as being, as a Montessori school child of upper middle class background, my promise is imparting to other people what is interesting or pleasurable about things that they normally probably wouldn't have noticed. Being a teacher And so language is much more interesting than most people have any reason to think it is. That's my job to share it, not just to know it. In terms of the music I like, I must admit, and I never thought about it until right now, very often when I'm enjoying it, I'm thinking, it's too bad more people don't understand that this is good. I'd like to communicate that. If I'm listening to something that's easy that anybody would like, like ham and cheese, there's a part of me that thinks, hmm, I'm like everybody else, and I'm just sitting here bopping to this. That's different from listening to Tchaikovsky and thinking, a lot of people would think this was boring, and it isn't, and I wish somebody were next to me and I could explain. Teaching people that the world is more interesting than they, than they might think. I'm really flying blind here, but no, go. Teaching. teaching. Teaching people that there's more to life than just sitting around. Yeah. Yeah. And- yeah. And I think that's part of this moment. I mean, I think what you're saying about this moment being here to stay, which yes. I guess means it's not a moment, right. leans on all of us to teach and yes. to point out these treasures that we are finding and share them. Right. The mm-hmm. idea is to share it with people and show that now this is in your phone. If you'll listen to it, mm-hmm. it's different than what you know, but you'll get a kick out of this, even though it has violins in it. For a lot of people, once there's a violin, forget it. Listen to this, and you'll see why some people like violins. Yeah, that. You can see I'm not a poet, but I'm I'm, I'm (laughs) trying. So, yeah. No, but that, that's something, that's a big advantage over 1921. 
there's something yes. that's changed. <laughs> <laughs> and also that all of it is so easy to experience. In 1921, you had to go watch somebody play it, and you might not have been in the mood, and records were terrible. <laughs> now all of this stuff in beautiful sound is in your pocket. And so that's another way that it's better now than in 1921. Yeah, just look in your pocket. Yes, that's right. <laughs>